Good morning. It is now day five for the uh, Let's Learn Quantum Mechanics project. Uh, let me just check the dashboard, make sure that uh, everything is running smoothly. So I'm going to start with um, with just sort of recapping. I've been doing that a lot, uh, but it's good to just sort of, you know, if you're popping in, you haven't seen any of this, what the heck's going on? So I'm learning 804. Uh, this is MIT's classes are uh, numbered, so uh, 8 corresponds to physics, and 04 means that this is the fourth in their kind of main sequence of courses, and that is quantum physics 1. And the reason for learning quantum mechanics is that, you know, when I was a kid, uh, when, well, kid, teenager, early 20s, I liked reading popular physics books, things like, you know, Brian Greene's Elegant Universe, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. And they talk about quantum mechanics and they talk about how crazy it is and how, you know, it's so intuition defying and strange, but yet it's the most successful theory we have of how reality works. And so I kind of wanted to understand how reality works. I kind of wanted to understand how that worked. And I think the problem is that if you only cover this material from a non-mathematical perspective, so you cover the perspective just from using, just kind of clutch together from your analogies of other systems or other things that you're familiar with, you lead to some misconceptions. So one of the comments I got about this project was someone saying to me, you know what, I heard that, uh, you know, I've been following these people who say things like, um, I'm trying to think of the specific claims, but you know, there's things like the what the bleep do we know and, and those kind of programs where people talk about stuff that, well, it, it, any scientifically informed person would know that that's like nonsense, that, you know, it's not the case that, well, the moon isn't really there if we're not looking at it or, you know, our beliefs generate reality or something like that. But I think that this, these failures of intuition, aside from just being a, a non-rigorous attempt to justify pseudoscience, it is also because the analogies that we're piecing together that when you don't have this mathematical basis, these analogies that you're piecing together to understand these things uh, are crude. And so sometimes you don't see why something is obviously not the right way of looking at it because you don't understand the math. You don't understand that that's you know not the right way of looking at it. So I, um, I'm just going to pull this up here a little bit. Sorry, get my other camera out of view there. Um, so for me, understanding the math was important because I think it's the only real way you can have an intuition about this thing. Now, I do want to separate doing the math from having intuitive ideas about it. So it's not to say that having an intuition depends on working out complex integrals and doing these kind of formulas. However, the intuition that you need to have is built off of having done the math. So if you don't have any experience with the math, it's kind of, in my opinion, at least from working through this, it's nearly impossible to have a good intuition about how you should think about quantum mechanics and how you should think about that. So for me, one of the big motivations for doing this project was just, I wanted to try to tackle a project where I could, um, I could really get that kind of understanding. Now, why the decision to focus on 804? Some people talked about other resources. There's lots of books. I even got one of the books um, that was recommended by MIT uh, for a different session of the same class, Introduction to Quantum Physics. Uh, I could have read a book. There's lots of other guides. Some people are linking to me other resources. Why this class in particular and why uh, take an MIT class? And part of it is just that that's what I'm familiar with. I did the whole MIT challenge, so I know how MIT resources are. I know what their strengths and weaknesses are. You can get halfway through another resource before you're like, oh, they're never going to actually cover this. Or, you know, though this isn't really what I wanted. So I was familiar with it. So it's just sort of my own bias. The other reason is that MIT classes are very good. They teach things for, you know, they're teaching them for very smart students who are taking like an elite education. So one of the problems that I often have with uh, a lot of, uh, um, I don't wanna say self-education resources, but like online resources for learning things is that they tend to be easy. Uh, they tend to water down the subject because they're trying to appeal to a mass audience. So the best example of that in my mind is that if you take some, um, so Coursera, for instance, I think uh, Andrew Ng, he was um, 
uh, he was a Stanford lecturer who had done some of this kind of open courses for machine learning and then he did his own version on Coursera. And I've actually watched the lectures for both of those. And his one for Stanford is, you know, he actually makes you do the math, there's actual problem sets, like it's like the MIT courses. Whereas the one on Coursera, it's like, okay, well, and if you haven't taken calculus, don't, don't worry about it. We're not going to like get into too much detail here. And I understand that the audience is, you know what, let's try to remove some of the difficult math parts so you can just get to the thing that you want. But on the other hand, the difficult math is partially how you understand that. And so for me, I, I don't like to avoid the difficulty. I don't like to pick these classes where you don't have to do those things. So MIT classes were also something that I wanted to pick because they are actually challenging. They, I, I know that I'm not going to get a watered down curriculum. I know that if I'm doing an MIT class, it's not going to be that I took some program where they removed everything that was difficult about it or everything that required some background knowledge and just gave me some kind of simplified watered down account. Now, my goals aren't going to necessarily be yours. For a lot of people, again, just reading one of those books like Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time is probably more than sufficient. However, the whole reason I got to this point was that I read those books and I felt dissatisfied. So that's another reason to turn to kind of this, which is a more rigorous resource. Now, the downside of a more rigorous resource is it's also way harder. And I'm feeling that right now. So what have I gotten through so far in this class? Well, uh, the first day uh, I started, I said that I was going to try to get to lecture 10. And this is because there's 24 lectures. Lecture 10 is right up to before the first midterm exam. And it also represents I can do five of the problem sets with that material. I should be able to do five of the problem sets. So my goal was to get through the first 10 lectures and then get through the first five problem sets. I would be not halfway through the lectures, but halfway through the problem sets. And then I can do the either the second half in one or two bursts right after. My goal was to try to finish all the lectures by April 15th so that I would have the remaining two weeks to just sort of improve weaknesses, work on things. So how has it been turning out? Well, I, I've been taking a lot longer on doing the problem sets than I'd hoped. And I think a big reason for that is just that there are some conceptual holes, some technical holes in my background. Some of this is that I'm actually missing material. So I, you can see this is 804. So you can imagine you took 801, 802, 803, and then you get to 804. I did not take 803. So I'm missing one of the classes in the prior sequence. I don't think that's a huge issue for my overall goal of having an intuitive idea of quantum mechanics. I do think that the ideas in there are important, so I don't want to say that you can just ignore them altogether, but I don't know whether going back and doing that entire class is necessarily worthwhile. I think maybe it's better to just focus on some key ideas, get a grasp of them, and then just move on. However, it is impacting me because sometimes I'm struggling through problems that I'm not sure how to solve and then I'm like as you know the per this equation which was of course discussed in that class and I'm like oh geez um, the other difficulty is just that the other classes I, I would re be required to know for this which would be um, not only classical mechanics and electromagnetism but single variable calculus multivariable calculus and differential equations um, I did them eight years ago when I was doing them in the MIT challenge and I have not used them in my daily life since then at least at the level of solving problem sets and doing that kind of thing. And so because of that, there's also a lot of things where I'm rusty. I'm not as familiar with it. So this week was also kind of coming face to face with that of, oh, right, they did cover that. Oh, I do kind of remember that. Okay. So what is the plan going forward now? Well, um, I've done one, uh, one and almost the second problem set. So I've done nearly two problem sets. So according to my schedule, I should be trying to do three today. I doubt that's going to happen. Um, I think it's kind of a trade-off point because I can work really hard on these problem sets and really grind through them. But I also have to think about, you know, I've got a month time. That's how much time I've allocated for this. And I have to use my time wisely so that it's being invested in where it's really going to matter. Now, if I had infinite time, Probably what I would do is finish these five problem sets and then grind through with um, the Feynman technique until I've mastered all the concepts and then go on to the next lectures. I don't really have infinite time. I, I'm, you know, life is going to intervene and I'm not going to be able to study this it perpetually, at least not at this pace. And my goal is to get as good as I can get in one month. So I think what I'm going to do is finish problem set two. 
I think today I'm going to still stick to the problem sets. I don't think I'm going to switch to anything else. However, I may not on Monday continue the problem sets if I haven't finished them quite yet. I may, um, I may swap off and work on something else. And I think if I'm getting back to Monday, I might spend a whole day. I, I, I would maybe push it to Tuesday if I, if I really feel like I'm, you know, struggling through all these problem sets. I may push it to Tuesday to work on going back, building some fundamentals before we go on in the lectures. But I really do want to try to get the lectures done by the 15th. So I think in that case, you know, if Tuesday I'm still not finished anything, I might just move forward with the lectures because the worry, of course, is that I'm focusing on things that I don't understand as much. And it may be the case of the stuff after is there's even more unique difficulties to that because there's more difficulties that I have to invest in learning those methods. So really the way I think of learning is, is kind of a spiral where you can always build more and more understanding. So if you have infinite time, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper while I'm kind of going up. So deeper, 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 deeper in your understanding. And so the question is just, where do you dig? And for me, I feel like um, obviously we want to have a good foundation. We want to have a good um, baseline of some of these techniques, some of these ideas for doing the problems. But there's always going to be deeper you can go. There's always going to be something you sort of understand and maybe you can understand more. And so prioritizing is is just the essence of it. So for me, I, I think probably what I'm going to be doing right now is um, finishing problem set two for sure. Spend the rest of the day working through the problem sets. Uh, I was kind of last night, I was thinking about it a little bit and I was a little bit on the fence of whether I wanted to keep doing practice or kind of pull off the practice and just sort of focus on, okay, what are the kinds of things I'm screwing up? Let's get a mastery of that. But I don't see enough common patterns where it's like, whoa, I don't understand this idea at all. And it's coming up again and again and again. It's a lot of different ideas. So I still think that practice is probably the right approach, even though these problem sets are hard for me. And I think I'm going to just keep working on them. Um, let's see how far we can go today. And then at the end of it, I think I'll do a, a final assessment at the end of today of whether, um, what I want to do early next week. Um, I think as well, uh, some of this stuff in the beginning is proving a bit more challenging. Now, normally my idea was to do about uh, three hour sessions. I mean, I've been going a little bit longer, but I've also been adding in, um, I've been adding in these little like summaries or, or dialects for your benefit. So, um, you know, I will say roughly three hours, maybe three hours and 15 minutes in sessions in the morning and the afternoon every day. But it might be that I need to do a little bit more than that. And if I have to do a little bit more than that, I'd like to do it a little earlier than a little later. So if it looks like this is really hard and I'm a little nervous about actually getting everything done on time and, and getting to a point where I'm, you know, getting a decent grade on the exam at the end of the month, uh, I might next week double down and do a little bit more work. If I look at my schedule, I think it's a bit more flexible. So I might push those to four hour sessions or maybe even go a little bit longer, just you know, do a few all day sessions just to um, get caught up, I guess, because I'm doing a little bit more catching up than I'd, I would have hoped for, for this particular class. I don't feel like the, um, the 804 material is necessarily what's holding me down. I think it's more the stuff that's, uh, that's from previous classes that I'm rusty with or 803 that I never covered. All right, so uh, I know you might be watching this a long time later. Uh, basically, what I'm going to be doing is just working on the problem sets, trying to articulate, trying to I'm trying to speak out loud a little bit more than I would in real life, just because I want you to kind of see my thought process. I want to try to do it out loud a little bit more. Um, but obviously, you know, if you don't understand, <laughs> if you haven't taken any physics classes, you haven't done any of this, this might not make sense to you. So part of my goal for this, some people were asking, why am I doing this? Because it's kind of hard to follow if you don't have any physics knowledge. But a big reason for doing this was just I wanted to have kind of some document of me doing the entire uh, process, the entire class. And then I can use that later if I want to explain kind of what my philosophy is towards studying or what my approach is towards studying. I have an example rather than just talking about it hypothetically. All right. So with that, I think I'm going to move on to... Um, going back into the problem sets. So let's switch the scene here. So I have been, uh, I've been doing it in this way where you can see on the top, um, top left hand side of the screen, 
is a browser window where I have the problem set right here, and then I have my notes, and then I have the, the live camera. I don't know how easy it is to see here. Um, I'm a little restricted because obviously to make things fully visible, I, it's, I have to do more than one window. The screen resolution isn't high enough. So if you are having difficulty seeing, uh, especially if you're having difficulty seeing um, uh, these notes, then uh, if you go to the 2013 spring session of 804, all this material is online. So this is problem set two, it's a PDF, you can just download it from there. And then if you're trying to figure out what, what the heck is he doing or what is he looking at, you can just get it from there. So I'm just gonna take off my sweater because I'm a little bit warm right now. And let's get going. <sighs> So we're going to go back because I think we were at uh, we we're at 8A for this problem set. Okay, so in this case, what we were doing. So let's get back to it. Where were we? Um, we were considering the. Uh, We're considering the kind of unphysical uh, wave function that looks like, or wave packet, I guess, that looks like this, where there's discontinuities, uh, and it looks like that. Um, that there is, essentially, it's a, you know, just a, um, I guess you, I don't know whether you call it a step function. What do you call this? A, it's like a square block of, of wave. And the reason that this is problematic or reason that this is not physical is that if we take the uh, Fourier transform of this, then you need to have, it's basically the Fourier transform or the expectation of Fourier transform is divergent. And so in this region right here at the edge, you need to have kind of arbitrarily high frequencies, high momentum, um, and so if we take the, the, you know, the uncertainty of the momentum, it means that if we're trying to figure out, okay, we apply the momentum operator here, well, we're going to have contributions from waves that are arbitrarily narrow. And so that's not very physical because that corresponds to a particle that has arbitrarily high momentum, you know, towards infinity. And so one way of avoiding this discontinuity is considering this approximation of the function here where we have the hyperbolic tan of uh, this function. And I'm not too familiar with hyperbolic tans. I don't even know whether I've ever done them in a class before. Um, I know that the idea is that if we have x squared plus y squared is equal to one, this is our, our regular, um, regular trig functions. Uh, whereas x squared minus y squared is equal to one are our hyperbolic trig functions. So hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic tan, secant, cosecant, all these kinds of things. And so whereas the trigonometric functions form a unit circle, the hyperbolic functions form these, uh, these kind of parabola that are like this. I'm, I'm not drawing them very well, but they look kind of like this. So, I mean, I maybe covered that a little bit, but I'm not like fluent in a lot of this trigonometry. So I'm not sure how well I'm gonna be able to do this, um, this integral. So basically we have to say for various values of B, convince yourself that this will approximate this kind of block function. So B is clearly it's controlling this width. Um, and we're saying that as B goes to zero, uh, it is, it is close to this kind of step function. And uh, with n roughly independent of b, and then we want to compute n when the limit of b goes to zero. And so n is the normalization constant, which preserves the fact that um, the interpretation of this uh, wave function is that the, um, the wave function, what am I want to say? The wave function, the, uh, norm squared, the norm squared of the wave function is, um, is, its, uh, is the probability density. So therefore the total integral over negative infinity to positive infinity has to be one. 
So essentially what we need to do in this right now is we need to show that when B goes to zero, this thing looks like this. And we need to show that uh, we need to figure out what N is in the limit when B goes to zero. So ugh, this is a little bit tricky. I'm not quite sure whether I can solve this, but uh, let's give it a shot. So what would be a good starting point here? Well, let's um, let's go to Wolfram Alpha and just do some playing around with this tan H function. Uh, so I've got tan X here. So let's try divided by two and see what happens. Uh, sorry, 0. 0.5. Let's try 0. 0.5 because we're going towards zero. So this is basically just increasing the scale at which it so essentially the the more it scales the quicker which makes sense because we're going off here so the quicker it becomes goes in this direction so that that makes sense now how do we get this um step thing so what is our what is our function here we have x plus eight divided by two and x minus a divided by two. So let's try, uh, let's try it. Let's say a is two. So this would be x minus one. Uh, is that plus this? No, it's plus this. Okay, so x plus. So let's look at this function. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're getting closer to this step function here. I don't really like this. Uh, I don't really like these bounds of this thing here. How do I? Oh. Uh, Okay, so what do we know about notice about this? Well, right away, so this, I think this B has to be a lot smaller than this because there's a contribution here. So let's try it instead of 0 0.1001. 0 Oh, 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 yeah, there we go. That's why. Okay, this you have to be over in brackets, I guess. Okay, so with this in brackets, it it's uh, the B is not changing the width of it, but it is changing the sharpness of this function. And uh, let's try it with 0.1 just so we can see it a little bit softer here. I was just forgetting the, that those have to be in brackets. Ed mass, right? Okay, so here we've got a little bit, it shows more smooth kind of behavior here at this 0.1. So we're seeing this kind of behavior, which makes sense. And some things to note, uh, this, is, this is height two. And I believe if we remove this, hold on a sec, if we remove this, it's only height one. So right off the bat, we know that there's a factor of two, and I think that was included here. Yeah, n over two. So that's gonna normalize this to uh so let's let's draw this out again here can you guys see i don't know whether this is visible oh yeah you can see it there okay so what is happening with this hyperbolic tan functions that we've added is that we've got uh 
uh, there's a factor of two there. So this is two is coming out of this. And this is controlling kind of the steepness. And uh, as B goes to zero, this is getting closer and closer to the step function. Um, so how do we how do we make this more rigorous? Wolfram Alpha is slowing down on me here. Let's try it again. You know, I'm just going to put this away because I think I understand the overall behavior. So we, we know from Wolfram Alpha qualitatively that this is what's happening, right? So now we have to talk about what's happening. Um, so with this A less, much less than B, much less than A, N is roughly independent of B. N is roughly independent of B. Okay, interesting. And compute N when B goes to zero. Oh, so we have to do the normalization of this. So what is the normalization? Well, basically, we have to say that the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of psi x conjugate psi x dx is equal to 1. So this needs to be equal to 1. So uh, the complex conjugate of this, um, I don't, this is only real. So I don't think there's any need to uh, involve the conjugate so we can just square this. So it should be N over two squared. And then we've got hyperbolic 10 x plus a over 2 b minus 10 hyperbolic 10 minus oh x minus a over 2 b squared now i'm thinking that this is going to be easier to work with as exponentials than trigonometric functions. So let's go find some identities. I remember looking them up yesterday. So if we just do uh, hyperbolic tangents on Wikipedia, it had some. Okay, so it is equal to so 10h x is equal to e to the 2x minus 1 over e to the 2x plus 1. So let's try working with that and see if that gets us anywhere. Uh, let's go back to our problem set. So we have, this is n squared over 4. Uh, oh, this is equal to 1. Let's just put that 1 over on the side here. Oh, no, no, sorry. Yeesh. Negative infinity. Right. I can put uh, I can put this on the inside now. This should be independent of... Uh... Yeah, this should be independent of that, so... All right, let's see if we can do some trigonometry to make this work. Uh, we have e to the two x plus a over two. And so we can just um, swap that out here to two x plus a minus one over e to the 2x plus a minus 1 minus e to the 2x minus a 
minus one d to the two x minus a Ooh, plus here plus one that looks like it matches we squared this uh, let's carry forward n squared of by four negative infinity I gotta put dx is here Good to put the dx's first, I think, and then I don't forget them. All right. Now let's multiply these things out. So FOIL, we're going to do the first terms. Let's go this squared. That's like it's making it worse, but let's just try to see here. We have e to the 2x plus a minus one squared two x plus a plus one squared minus two minus two e to the two x plus a Minus one times d to the two x minus a minus one d to the two x plus a plus one d to the two x plus a plus one. Oh, do we have enough space for this? Final term, a plus, yeah, I think so. E to the two x uh, minus a minus one squared d to the two x plus a minus a All right, is anything popping out for solving this? Let's just go here. I think a lot of stuff is going to cancel, but you know, let's just copy it over here carefully and get it on a new piece of paper. I think this is good to work it out at the very least. This is some good practice, even if I make some mistakes. So what do we have here? N squared over 4. Infinity positive infinity dx. Now we have 2x plus a. take anything out of this here. Hmm. A 
This is not looking too, too helpful right now. Are there any other trigonomic identities that I might be able to use? So, uh, we also have e to the x minus e minus x, e to the x minus x. Hmm. Well, hmm. I'm not seeing anything obvious here. Let's just carefully expand all of this, and then maybe some stuff's gonna come out. I don't know, I don't usually like getting this into the weeds because usually there's something simplifying that I'm missing. These are gonna be four, eight, yeah, it's this, it's the one over here. Because that's one way of doing it is with this one. The other way of doing it, it was with the x minus x. That might be a better format, doing it this way, with, uh, the, with this one here. This one might be more useful. Let's try it again with that, maybe. You know what? I can maybe exploit this sine hx over cos hx. Maybe I can exploit that relation. Well, this is also kind of a mess. Uh, hmm. I think I'm missing some trigonomic identities to do this well. In the interest of not wasting too, too much time on this, I think I'm gonna go forward, but if it looks like I'm you know, missing a lot of trigonomic identities, especially with these hyperbolic ones, uh, that might be something worth getting a big list of them, practicing them a little bit. So let's, I'm gonna go to the solution just because we've got a lot of promises to cover. Okay, where are we? This is problem set seven and then A, okay. So this is roughly what we did. We did this in Wolfram Alpha, so I would give myself a point for that. Oh, here we go. Uh, the following picture shows the plots of this. The B, the graphs between X is probably center of the origin height one and width A. Thus, n is on the order of, oh, so they never even calculated it. All right, I'm trying to do this big formula to get the exact form of it, but they just said n, I'm just gonna write this. n is on the order of one over root a, which I mean, this is the same as it was the last time with the normalization constant. So, okay, I'm just gonna put a note. It worked. guessed. See, this is hard because some of these problem sets, like they've been actually doing the questions and I've been guessing and then I've been feeling bad that I haven't actually gone through the formula, but I'm glad I stopped myself before I got too into the weeds with this one. So let's go over to B now. B, uh, show that the Fourier transform is equal to this. Okay, this one we actually have to show. So this one here is uh, it's tilde 7b k is equal to, all right, well, Fourier transform. Let's see if I can remember this from memory. 1 over 2 pi plus infinity plus infinity. And then I believe we're taking dx e to the negative i kx, oh, one of them's negative, one of them's positive, and I always screwed up. I'm gonna say negative i kx, and then I'm gonna double check it. 
uh, times f of x, which is in this case, this big mess of a, mess of a function. Now let's pull the n over two. So we're gonna just pull that out. n over, which is uh, one over root a, so. Uh, oh, so this is n over, is it root two pi? I don't think it's root two pi, but we've got n over pi over two here. Uh, and this is n over two, so this is, we pull up the n over two. How are we getting, right, you know what, I'm just gonna put this right here and then there is maybe gonna be an extra factor coming out here. And then this is four. And then we got this big mess of a function here. Now I'm gonna just double check the Fourier transform just to make sure I'm not forgetting something. Here. Mm -hmm. Where is our Fourier transform? Did we do it? Which class do we do the Fourier transform in? He was after. Uh, actually, I think I have it earlier in this problem set. Let me just check it here. Fourier transform is k is equal to, yeah, it's minus e to the kx. Oh, root, oh, root 2 pi. Nah, okay. Yeah, I forgot the square root. So if it's root 2 pi, then that is equivalent to n over root 2 over pi, like this, correct? Well, let's get down to eight here. Okay, root pi over two. The pi over two, what? Eesh. All right. Uh, that's not matching the constant I have, which is worrying. We have one over root pi, let's just, and then we have, we pull out the n over two, or the n, um, yeah, n over two, root two pi. So I have n over, Two, 2 pi. This is what I have. I don't know why I'm getting this thing here. Okay, well maybe it'll maybe it'll come out of the integral. Let's just go to eight now. And then, ooh, what is our thing again? We have hyperbolic tan of x plus a over two divided by b. of this. Uh, so, <sighs> hmm. B sign this or that. Mm. I think this is maybe going to require some trigonomic identities that I'm not familiar with. Hmm. 
I'm giving another five minutes, and if I can't, then I'll look at the answer. So, hmm, well, we can split it into hyperbolic sines, cosines. With these exponentials, complex exponentials. Like if this breaks down into um, cosine kx, is it minus i sine x? I just did this recently. Yeah, plus, yeah. So this is minus sine, uh, i sine kx. Then we multiply them out. How am I going to get in this form? Hmm. look at some of our identities here. So this so we can do I think integration by parts because we have two parts here. Uh, And then this 10, this dx is equal to uh, natural logarithm, though, but that's not showing up in the thing.
Yeah. All right. I'm going to check the answer. Oh, Mathematica. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. Well, this is one of the things with the problem sets, and I'm getting this feeling as well is that these problem sets, because the assumption is that we have access to all these resources, all these tools, this is not exactly exam situation, and I'm treating it a little bit more like an exam situation. Now, I am looking stuff up. I'm doing things on Wolfram Alpha, that kind of thing, but I'm treating those as kind of like non-rigorous that I should be, you know, pencil and papering this. But uh, we know the 4A transform of 10H up to a diverging constant is because the Fourier transfer is linear and subtract two ten h's, the constants we are neglecting will cancel so we can ignore them. We can now obtain the Fourier transform of tan equals b. Suppose, let me get this whole argument down here. Ooh, okay. So let's write it down. So, uh, equals i root 2 cosecant hyperbolic cosecant e pi over 2. So Fourier transform is linear, and since we'll subtract two hyperbolic tangents, constant real neglecting will cancel, so we can ignore them. From 65, we now know obtain the formula uh, we now obtain the Fourier transform of 10 AX plus B. Fourier transform of AX is now equal to Uh, equal to one over just going to do um, is there like a Fourier transform operator? Let's do this. Yeesh, this is a mess. Okay. You guys still see it now? I think it's a little bit off. Let me just. Uh... I think this is gonna just gonna. Ah. <sighs>
Wow, I'm not even going to jot this down right now. I think. Oh. We're going to uh, we're going to need to do a lot more work to get this. I'm just going to put a note here for this. All right. Let's see if we can go do C now. C. How does this? Uh, behave for large values of k compared with k7 from before. What does this imply about p squared? So um, this uh, for large values of k, what's happening here? Well, for large k, this is going to be equal to uh, sine. Well, sine is just going to rotate, so that's not a problem. But how does sine, hyperbolic sine, change? So let's look at hyperbolic sine in world time also. Hyperbolic sine uh, goes like this. So it's going up and up and up and up. So for large k, this is increasing. K squared. It's getting smaller for momentum squared. Hmm. Oh, is it showing on the screen here? Yeah, okay, okay. Hmm. Huh. What does this imply about that squared, theorem squared? I think we want this to like blow up, right? Like we want this to blow up, but this is in the bottom. So this is getting smaller and smaller, you know? Can we do this in Wolfram Alpha? Let's try this. Um, So it's going like this here. Uh, expectation of this squared. Can we just do this? Well, it looks like it's tapering down, so I don't understand what I'm... must be doing something wrong, because I'm assuming we're, the thing we're trying to show is that it's blowing up. Let's look at the answer here. All right. We have that for large k. Now so we're supposed to convert into this form, so let's, let's just write that here. Okay. 
to n squared pi divided by 2 b squared sine squared k over 2 i by e to the magnitude of k i b dies exponentially at infinity, whereas we saw that this is precisely equal to zero outside of a bounded domain. We know that this is certainly finite. Oh, so it is It is supposed to be finite. Okay, so my intuition was correct about that. I, or my, uh, my analysis was correct about that. My intuition was wrong. Uh, all right, and then uh, let's do D quickly. Oops. I'm not going to move my thing here. In the limit that b is much, much less than a, so that n is independent of b, and you can use the value computed above without evaluating an integral, show that it is roughly proportional to 1 over the square root of a, b. So we computed this. Where are we getting the, so this is, well, that's that. And well, what do we have for this? Well, um, sorry, this was this. So you have n squared pi over two b squared sine squared k a over two over e to the magnitude k pi b. Uh, we have, what was our, um, our momentum, expectation of momentum. The function sine squared x oscillates rapidly in x over many periods and is as well approximated by this ax over v is equal to is roughly one half. Yeesh. All right. Um, so that's saying that this is roughly equal to n squared pi over two. Uh, b squared over e to the k pi b. Uh, mine, and then we want this. That's this. And then let's just, uh, just subtract it out here. Minus... Did we calculate the momentum anywhere? Let me just to check the notes above to see if they were calculated anywhere. I don't think so. <sighs> Expectation of momentum is this no but that's I guess not the Fourier transform that would be just the regular function right yikes <sighs> yeah I'm not sure how to get the other side of this one For large k, which means that this dies exponentially at affinity, whereas we saw this is precisely equal to zero. But this is what we already did. By symmetry, oh, Jesus. OK.
So this is just this. Uh, therefore, we have is equal to This is only for large K. It's equal to DK K squared. Hold on a second. We don't actually have this. Let me just write it. I, uh, I don't have space over here. I'll just try to write it quickly here. So we have. DK K squared. One over A b squared sine squared k over 2 over sine h squared pi k b over 2 and then this is equal to uh Well, again, I guess we get this one half constant pulled out here. Y equals KB. dy dv dy over b wow all right Yikes. All right. Um, this one was, yeah, this one I don't think I would have, there's no way I would have gotten this one. Um, I think this is an example of a technical challenge because I just haven't done integrals this difficult in eight years. And I think this was, this is just on the order of more challenging than a lot of the ones that I would have done back then as well. So, all right, we've got uh, we've got done problem set two. Now, if I look over my problem sets here, there's quite a few weak points, quite a few things that uh, from problem sets one to two. At this point, I think there's probably a lot of work to be done in building up some things, but I think just given how much we're covering, I have to decide whether I want to keep going. Let's do problem set three. If problem set three is the same as these these three, then uh, these two, then I think I want to go straight to doing Feynman techniques and doing this kind of thing to fix some of these problems because I'm a little worried that there are some fundamental ideas, fundamental um, solution techniques that I just are not ingrained in me right now. Uh, and I think spending some time on that might save me some headaches and future problems rather than just going forward with this. I'm not sure how they get. Uh, this is another integral. All right. Okay. So let's uh, let's look at problem set three. Although we're certainly not at a point where we're comfortable with problem sets one and two. So let's go back. All right. So let's open a new one here. Thank you. 
Operators, okay. One linear operators. Operators said to be linear for any functions fg, if for any constants a and b, operator of a f x plus b g x is equal to a times the operator of f x plus b times the operator g of x. So which of the following operators are linear? This is not the solution, no, this is, oh, right, right, okay. This is just explaining what the operators are. So let's do it. Uh, identity should be pretty easy. So if we have operator of a g of x. Well, this is very clearly equal to Oh, sorry. Oops. Oops, oops, oops. Is equal to um, what's the right way to express this? Well, this is just equal to a f of x plus b g of x, but this is also equal to a linear. That one's pretty easy. A I two squares. This one's almost certainly not going to be linear. So we have S A F X plus B G X is equal to squared F squared X. X I think I can just put the squared in here, yeah. I think notationally this is okay. Plus uh two A B G F of X G of X plus B squared. Cross terms, therefore, not linear. All right, three. Uh, what is this D hat? D hat is derivative, okay. So derivative of a f x plus b g oh, g x is equal to a f prime x plus b g prime x. But this is also equal to a d f x plus v g d. Oh, well, get my orders down here. D g x therefore is linear. Four. Uh, integral. X is equal to, uh, so this one we're going to have A F X plus G B G X. 
Apple II. Uh, That's going to be equal to I f of x is equal to from zero to x. Uh, oh, okay. So this is equal to from zero to x. x prime a f of x prime Oh. Should be able to just separate this out, no? Am I not wrong or is this a valid thing to do? Let's think about it. If we had, just hypothetically, we had function looks like this, an interval of zero to let's say five, and we had a function that looks like this, then this distance plus this is going to be, it's going to be linear, right? It should be at least. equal to a general x therefore i x linear i think that should be right i think that should be right okay uh, all right. This will be a hat of uh, equal to a f plus three. fx, oh sorry, fx plus 3, x plus 3, a of x, hold on a second, adds 3, Plus three. Right, yeah. think you can get can you can you get back into that I don't think so
I don't think it's on here. Hmm. This isn't shifts, this is adds three. Like we can't, this is, this is not equal to, um, A times. B at G of X. So, not linear. Uh, what else do we have? Um, okay. Close. G of X not equal a f what is this would be a g of x plus b g of x so not linear and translates by l so this is for linear. All right, let's see if I got this right. I mean, this is pretty easy, I think. At least compared to the last stuff we've been doing. So let's get a new uh, tab here. And open up the solutions. Uh, to show this is linear, yeah, not linear, differentiation is linear, linear, not linear, uh, not linear, linear, okay, so we were right on everything. All right, B, the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the following operators. Okay, identity operator. Um, all f of x are eigenfunctions. with value one, the eigenvalue equals one. Uh, squares of f of x goes to a f of x. So what are the eigenfunctions of the squaring operator. So we need to have f squared of x is equal to a f of x. So f squared of x over f a is equal 
equal to a constant. So for what functions is this true? Constant functions? I'm going to say uh, constant functions f of x equals c are eigenfunctions. And the eigenvalues are, or the eigenvalues. Um, or c squared divided by c, I guess. All right, let's try three. Third one. Uh, x hat x. So we want x f of x is equal to a f of x. Mm. And functions don't change when you add x. You multiply by x. Let's just put a pause in that one second. I know that uh, d f of x is equal to f of x a uh, eigenfunctions are exponentials. with e to the ax and eigenvalue a. So I'm going to put this one here, translation operator. Or no, this is not translation operator. This is... Uh, position operator. Well, we know that this is the position operator and we know that the eigenfunctions are the observable of the position function, which is delta functions. So we kind of know from that physical picture that this is gonna be eigenfunctions are delta uh, delta x as if you have some delta function here with uh, delta x with um, x, excuse me, x minus x zero and eigenvalues of one over x zero. Right, because if, if this is x minus x zero, let's say we're three out 
we're multiplying it by three, so we've got to divide by three, right? Okay, let's check our work. Right forms of the operator in general. any non-vanishing function for this. Uh, Uh, I'm going to add this uh, non vanishing S squared. To find the eigenfunction eigenvalues of the square operator, we need to solve the equation f squared x equals lambda fx, where lambda is any complex number, meaning that f of x can be either equal to. They talk about square normalizable. Oh, oh, I'm missing a whole section here. Explain how your answers change if the space of functions. Oh, geez, okay. I'm missing a whole section here. Uh, space of functions, which your operator acts, is arbitrary functions on the real line, continuous functions on the real line. Continuous functions on the real line which do not diverge in infinity and square normalizable functions. So let's go through this again. So this is, yeah, this one's fine. Uh, continuous functions on the real line which do not diverge in infinity. Um, so it's just IV here. Uh, you can just put not uh, square normalizable. And then what I have here, I have this is uh, arbitrary function on this uh, for continuous functions. Well, this is not a continuous function, so uh, no. For and then, then because this is continuous end, so no. Second one, no, and then the third one, the final one is yes, because it has uh, Jouy square normalizable. Okay, and then this one here is, uh, it works for all of them. So let's just go through the answers again. Eigenfunction of the multiplier is uh, 
x0. Why is it not 1 over x0? Oh, right, right, right. The, let me just put this in here. Eigenvalue is stretch. So I was doing what you have to do to undo the eigenvalue as opposed to what the eigenvalue is. X0. Uh, On a continuous function, it was not square integral. Okay, so it's not square integral, so it's good to know. It's a good fact. Find one e to the lab of x, exponentials, all the complex numbers. Uh, as generally the exponential diverges at infinity. Oh, right, right, right. Um, so this is, sorry, this is not. Uh, only if purely imaginary is it not diverge and then it's also Never square integral, but never. Visible. Okay. All right. A little bit, a little bit of hiccups on the these second parts there, but I, I understand them now. Okay. C. Show that the eigenfunctions of TL translation by L are of the form EDX GX, where B is a complex number, G is periodic with period L. What is the eigenvalue of TL when acting upon? Okay, so TL just shows that. So we have <coughs> fx minus l equal to f of x. So <sighs> e to the beta x g x to so we show that this is equal to um it's minus l so e to the b x minus l well g to x minus l if it's periodic is going to just be g to the x so we have this is equal to, oh, excuse me, uh, e to the bx minus bl. g of x. 
bx. Is that a good way of doing this? I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Let's try doing it with uh, sine and cosine, I guess. Oh, oops. This is equal to. Uh, if we have it just, if we do the exponents, we should have a gx. And we have cosine bx plus, um, yeah, plus i sine bx, and x, cosine bx. Plus I sine yeah. hmm. I think as we know the L is a constant. We're essentially saying e to the beta x I'll just do it here e to the negative beta l Hmm. It's not obvious to me why that's an eigenfunction with this exponential term. I mean, this is going to just... I guess this is just going to be a number, right? And then we still have our same thing. So this is just going to be a number. Um, lambda TL. So this um, eigenfunction, or this eigenvalue, is just going to be e to the negative beta L, no? Require that this, this, uh, oh, okay, yeah. Okay, I did get that right. Oh. 
Okay. I think, yeah, this is right. All right. Let's go into problem two. Problem two, translation operator. Position operator acts on functions of position f of x as x hat f of x equals f of x, f of x, f of x. Translate by L operators this. Show that, oh, okay, so commutation, all right, TL. Is equal to minus L of T hat. Oh. So we need to show this. Show. So that's t hat l x hat minus x hat t hat l. Um, So uh, let's just apply it to F, I guess. So T hat L X hat F of X minus X hat T hat L F of X. So we take this uh, this first. And we have hat L X F of X. And then we take uh, this minus and then we have this is equal to X minus L F X minus L, right? equal to um, hmm. again the same thing here No, 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 something I've done wrong there. All right, let's do this again. X hat am I not am I missing this? Is this why? Like what's the I guess this is only X over here. And then we have minus L F of it's minus L equal to minus L. But why is this X? (laughs) 
Why wouldn't it be x minus though? Don't you take what's ever in here? I guess the x operator just multiplies an x. It doesn't actually, um, it's just multiplying an x. It's not actually taking this here. Okay. All right here. X operator just multiplies by x, not necessarily y, s of y, or any y. Okay, I, th I think that's a little aside. Okay, let's go on to, uh, this, this was A, B, show that T commutes with the derivative operator. So we have T, L, B, minus T, T, L. Prime X. Minus minus L. Equals X minus L at prime X minus L equals zero. C show that RHS should define the RHS Taylor expansion. Oosh, okay. So we need to show that show <laughs> oh. Excuse me. Um, show that translation operator equal to e to make L. That the derivative operator? What are we looking at here? Wow, okay. Uh, Taylor expansion. Let's just get that. Uh. E to the X. Okay. All right, now let's go over here. Show that this, ooh, okay. Um, well, let's take the Taylor series of this. Let's follow this hint. So we've got one plus, uh, I guess one plus minus uh, root of operator plus Minus uh, derivative operator squared two plus over three factorial. Oh no no, uh, yeah, three factorial. So this three factorial is. Six 
minus LD derivative of three fourth. And then uh, four factorial is four times all this, which is 24. And then we'll just go plus dot, dot, dot. All right. Uh, so, uh, equal to so um, so we need to show uh, this translates function So let's just add a one minus that plus L squared. Minus Q Q X So <clears throat> can we say about this? Places with arbitrary f of x on each side, what would it look like? Well, we would get f of x minus l is equal to 1 minus l f prime of f prime of x plus L squared F double prime of X two minus cubed triple prime X six plus F So I think the idea is that this is, should look like something to me. All right, uh, let's go check our Taylor rules here and see if anything pops out of this. Nth order Taylor homomial. So I think the idea here is that if we look at this nth order Taylor polynomial, what do we see? Well,
the function is uh, we've got this x minus x zero squared This x minus x zero so let's just write this down here. So we have v of x is equal to sum over all values of n f to the n, uh, f to the nth derivative, x0. x minus x0 power of n. So this is kind of what we're seeing here. Excuse me. This is kind of what we're seeing here. We have, um, this looks like this. So we're kind of saying, what are we saying? If we took the Taylor form of this f to the xl. So let's just do that over here. Excuse me. So if we do f to the xl with this formula, we get equals. Well, f to the zeroth power I think this is one and then let's go so we've got x zero what's this x zero here If we just did this at zero, let's see, we just did this at zero, then it would be one plus F X. This is one X minus L. Oh. 
Hmm. And I'm not too sure about this one here. Now this looks like the form of the Taylor equation, but I can't quite figure out what I'm supposed to do to get it to fit. Hmm. Yeah, let's look at the answer. What do we have here? Oh, we have, we started on two up here. Okay, yeah, all right, this is right. B. This is also right, okay. This one is tricky. Okay. Okay. This means right hand side. The right hand side is going to look suspicious like a Taylor series. Which I suspected. Alright, um F of U can be represented as a Taylor expansion about some other point U0 at distance delta U. So this is equal to F of u0 plus delta u okay is equal to of u0 so we were we were missing this formula here delta u squared over 2 times f Zero plus dot dot dot. All right. Let's go D. Use results A and C to show that the derivative of operator in X is equal to the uh, is equal to the identity operator. So interesting. Okay. How do we show this? Well, um, well, 
let's just start by writing it out. All right. Uh, so this one here is derivative of x, x, x hat, f prime of x. Do we need to use c? This should be, uh, what is the uh, chain rule here? Oh, let me look up the chain rule. So I don't hear chain rule. Uh, DX, DZ. There's no chain rule, it's the product rule, I guess. I think we get this is equal to x f prime x plus f of x minus x f prime x equal to f of x. So this is equal to, I don't know why we needed c. All right, let's just go forward, E. If this is equal to that, how does DL act on if K are the Fourier transform of X? In other words, modification of corresponds to translating F X by L. Hmm. All right, well, let's take the Fourier transform is equal to one over root two pi negative infinity, positive infinity, dx e to the negative i k x f of x minus l equal to what? Well, I think we're probably going to do a change of variables here to get it to be in somewhere else. So if we go 1 over root 2 pi, negative infinity to infinity, dx e to the negative i k x plus l. Let's go u u then this is gonna be equal to one over root two pi IKL e to the uh, e to the uh, negative IKX or IKU FU 
And so we get out a factor of this is not factor of u, what we're integrating, so we can pull it out here. So then we integrate it and we get this. Excuse me. I guess we can just uh, get this rid of this too. Okay. So it has a, oh, I'm not on the screen. So we have a factor of IKL here. Um, so it changes the phase. And how does the derivative act? I use part C and E. So let's just check our D and E first before we go part too much forward. D, from part A, we know this and this. So I didn't do it that way, but I mean, isn't this also correct? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything wrong with my method though. All right. Okay. Yeah. This is correct. All right, now let's go forward. Uh, e, F. F, uh, use part C and E to determine how D acts on F, K. Does this make sense? No TL on F K is equal to E to the uh, E to the I or I guess negative I K. Is that right? Negative I K. Negative I K. Mean of IKL, uh, mean of IKL, okay, and we know that DL, uh, DL. On any function, might as well write it as fk equal to e to the oh, let's put this in the derivative form or this form here. So it's equal to Uh, 
And so this right here um, is uh, okay. Uh, well, when we take the derivative of this, the L drops down with a minus. No, 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 this is on the outside. Hmm. What are the parts I'm supposed to put together here? C and E determine how D hat acts on of tilde. I think we're factoring here, right? So, e to the i k l. So, e to the i k l, um, negative i k l is going to be uh, one. Um, minus, minus I, uh, plus, and minus, Yeah, I think 
think I want to just look back at what this other one was here. We did for part C. So if we look here, what we did for part C, we have this right here. So we need to show that here. So we have So it's equal to a tilde um, Yeah, Okay, I'm just going to be take just a quick two minute break and I'll be right back. All right, I'm, uh, I'm back now. Let's try to finish this question. I think, well, let's think about what we're doing here. I'm trying to see how the derivative operator acts on the uh, Fourier transform. Now we know that uh, it's saying using parts C and E. So E, we showed that this translation operator 
uh, acts by removing this EDIKL. Uh, that's what it that's what it does to that um, to the Fourier transform. So the question is, what does it do on? Um, so what does the derivative do on that function? Maybe I'm going about this wrong. I'm trying to use these particular parts, but what we should just look at is um, the same process we did for the same process we did for the first one for question e here so we have equals one over root two pi negative infinity positive infinity uh, dx e to the negative i k x of f prime of x and so the question is Is this what we want? What did we show in E? We showed I think what oof, I think what we're getting out of this is that uh, well the derivative times this it's going to come out on the other end right as f of x so it's one over root two pi f of x and then you have this. Um, sum of neg negative e to kx. Is that not right? Can I not pull that out? And then if we were to evaluate this integral, what do we get? Uh, what do we get here? We get, well, if we took the derivative, took the derivative of this, we would get negative i k e to the negative i k x. We need one over this. So we take it again, it cancels. So we get negative i kx. Let's check. Let's check where we're going. See if we're on the right path here. Okay, they're starting with the Taylor expansion. So let's write what they wrote down. This e is equals. Oh, they keep doing this to me. All right. Equals minus one. Will be 
plus dot 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 f nine k. Uh, Taylor expands the result in part e. ILK. This is also minus here. No, yeah. Is equal to IK. E to the I, L, K. K is equal to 1 minus I, K, L plus dot 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 F, K. So if we get derivative operator here, So this was not right. I'll just point that out. So let's go through forward now. I think I understand this. I just wasn't getting them matched up. All right, G. Use the definition of the position operator, the definition of the Fourier transform, to determine how x acts on the Fourier transform of x f tilde k of fx. Well, let's just try that out. Hmm. I think I want to do something like integrating by parts. That's the thing that's sounding familiar here. So let's look at it. All right. So UV. So integrating by parts, we want to do what here? Infinity plus infinity is equal to u dx. Uh, 
uh, here we go, uv dx equal to u. So let's look at it this way. We've got, uh, this is going to be equal to x. Which one do we want on the outside here? Hmm. I'm not sure if anyone else is still watching us, but uh, we're learning uh, quantum physics one. This is uh, 804. <clears throat> on the outside of this though. Let's go back to this. Uh, let me see how this position operates. So if we take this, well, we want the two in the same. Let's go back to the entering by parts. So we want to get these two together. So we can consider them one. Let's just move the X over here. So if we take So let's let you be. Uh, which one do we want on the outside? I don't know whether I want any of on the outside. I don't know whether I want f of x on the outside or I want x on the outside. Well, let's just try one of them and then we can undo it if this is the wrong way. X DX E V I K X F of X minus minus this one because X zero X is just one, so we can just ignore that. One times uh, V, which is E to the negative by KX F of X. Dx, uh, dx. Oh, yikes. Okay, so this is what do we have here? Well, this becomes f tilde k changes for f tilde k. And since it is, uh, put, uh, just divided by root two pi, and this also becomes 
tilde k binary root two pi. And there's no x anymore. I think I screwed something. Oh, I think I screwed up something. Let's. Can you guys not see what I'm looking at here? I don't know whether I can make it bigger. Let's go back to uh, this formula here. So, oh, this is also a struggle right now. I'm trying to integrate by parts, but it looks like. Yeah, looks like I didn't get what I wanted to get. So I agree over this. Yeah, I don't know. All right, let's just uh, let's just look at the answer. For two. We're definitely gonna have to come back and, or I'm definitely gonna have to come back and do some more work on these. So let's see G here. Okay. X hat F tilde of K is equal to x hat one over root two pi e k e to the negative i k x f of x. Oh geez, did I do? Okay. How do we get this result? So let's walk it through one step at a time. So they set it up derivative with respect to k. So not this is not the Fourier transform. E to negative eight i k x f of x. Because isn't this supposed to be x? Like if we look at the Fourier transform, uh, where's where's the Fourier transform? 
Like I copied it down here. And it's dx. No. Oof. Root pi e to the negative i k x f x is equal to one over two root two pi d k i derivative of k. So let me see if I can plug out what's going on here. So when we have this way of substituting this, because this is going to be x e to the negative i k x. If we change this to i derivative with respect to k, e to the i k x. Well, what happens when we do this? Is there not? A, there must be a minus sign here. No, the minus sign got. How did they get rid of the minus sign? Okay. So when we do this, the i k comes down. And we have e and uh, the i k x. So the i x comes down. This is with respect to k. i k x is equal to. Negative x e to the i k x. How are they getting that? I think this must just be a typo. Because if we look over here, they preserved it. So I think they must just have forgotten to put the minus sign here. So if we have i partial derivative with respect to k e to the negative i k x, then uh, what what would we get? Uh, we would get i negative i at negative i x e to the negative i k x. Uh, and this would be equal to x e to the negative i k x. So essentially what we're doing here is we are using this process, substituting this for this. Okay. And then... They're pulling out the. Where's my Where's my first Fourier transform notes here? I feel like I'm crazy that. Uh, where is Fourier transform? Once we start seeing the tilde showing up in my notes. It is DK. So I must have written this wrong here. This is DK. 
then I substituted it. So I got the right answer here, but this is the wrong. This math doesn't work. Because this stays DK. I don't know whether that matters though. The other things are right. Okay, and then we pulled out the K here. How are we able to pull out that K? This is just an operator. Hmm. Okay. All right, let's uh, go on to H. Verify that the commutation relation Hold whether you're acting on a function f of x or its Fourier transform. What lesson do you take from this? Uh, well, obviously, dx f of x. Let's just put with g. Yeah, if we just put g of x minus x hat d hat g of x is equal to g of x for either f k or f of x. That seems pretty trivial. Um, I can't be what they mean by this. It must mean something else. I'm assuming this is something to do with it, linearity. Let's just see what the answer is here. Operator statement is not changed. Representation either position or momentum of the functions we consider. K is equal to I K I F tilde K minus I K A F tilde K. I 
right, so this is minus k. And this is uh, plus this times this is equal to uh, F K. And then uh, plus k. That's what they want to show. Okay. All right, let's try uh, any more problems that we have. This goes up to four. All right, kind of halfway through. Eesh. Right, three A. Let A and B be linear operators. Let C denote know their commutator so that C is also a linear operator. So by the definition, <clears throat> we know that it's each linear operators. So C is equal to Uh, is equal to a hat b hat minus c of b hat a hat and so that is going to be a hat b hat b hat, a hat abba uh, x And f of x this on a f of x what is this equal to? This is going to be equal to a hat b hat. Plus A at B at So given that these are linear operators and just already bump them through. So we have a uh, a a hat. Maybe we don't need to do it that way, right? We can just do um, a hat b hat f of x minus trying to have it in the form is equal to a c hat f of x plus 
B C hat G of X. So There we go, so we've proven that one. B, suppose A and B share a common eigenfunction, theta AB, i.e., okay. Show that AB must be annihilated by the commutator. So C, AB is equal to Maybe C B B A uh, A B uh, Yeah, I don't have a problem. This is linear. So this is gonna be A B minus B A equals zero. Oh, finally, some questions I'm uh, getting. All right. Now let's do C. Suppose that they commute to zero. So operators are, can A and B share common eigenfunctions? Uh, Yes. So let a hat equal b hat equal. Let say uh, then a uh, a commutes with itself. Since a commutes with itself, then they have common eye functions. That seems trivially true. Supposing a B commute, are all functions of A necessarily also eigenfunctions of B? If so, explain why. If not, give a counter example. So I would say no. And I think the reason why we could see that is that one, uh, one, and let's say, uh, Let's pick a, a simple function then. Let's which uh, which one's that a simple eigenfunction? I think uh, yeah, D has a simple eigenfunction. So this is all functions. And this is um uh, exponentials only, but if we do if we do this, then we get b minus d is equal to zero. Uh, that question. Let's hopefully see. We got that one right. All right. Be interchanged price because okay. Uh, da, da, da. yeah. Okay, that's clear. Uh, all right. Four, two, three. Okay, now let's go on to question four. Great, there's how many parts? Eight parts, all right. Question four. Operators and commutators in quantum mechanics. As we have seen in quantum mechanics, position, 
position and momentum are represented by linear operators acting on the weight function psi of x as uh, momentum operator is equal to h bar over i, derivative of x of this, and x hat is equal to x of this. So representing observables as operators implies a host of facts about observables in quantum mechanics. In this problem, we will use the results you derived about mathematical operators to deduce properties of observables in quantum mechanics. So A, using results from the previous three problems together with the representations of, mom of the momentum and position given above, show that the, that the position momentum commutator takes the value of h bar over i. So Now, if we take this on psi, what do we get? Well, x hat on psi is x psi. Minus uh, x hat on... Over I, uh, psi prime. All right, what other information do we have that we can apply to this? Oh, I'll look at the time. It's already 11. Um, I think this is a good point to stop. I'm going to take a little break. I'll be back around 2 p.m. Um, let me just jump over to the screen here. So obviously, problem set three, also quite challenging. All the problem sets have been quite challenging so far. So what does that mean? I think... Um, there's two things it means. One, the problem sets are intended to be challenging. They're intended to be the kind of thing that MIT students are working together. They're collaborating. They're, you know, they're doing their own work, but they're getting hints from each other. There's, they're, they're not intended to be, for example, like an exam situation that's done in a very small amount of time. They're supposed to be difficult. On the other hand, I do have more resources than I do because I have the solutions, so I can kind of go back and get hints and. So often I'm using a hint that I got earlier somewhere else. So the, having the solutions and pairing them with that to get hints makes them considerably easier. <clears throat> Additionally, um, there's quite a bit of work here. So sometimes these derivations are longer than I would be expected to do an exam or they're more. That being said, I don't think uh, even if the difficulty of the problem sets is maybe somewhat higher than, um, than, I, than I would ideally want either for the purpose of passing the final exam at the end, which is sort of my benchmark, uh, or for my ultimate goal of, of having a kind of intuition. That being said, there are clearly some issues that I'm having. Some of these issues are conceptual. Some of these issues are technical. Uh, I still think that, you know, working through the problems in this way is probably the right approach, but I am starting to feel like there's enough stuff here that I'd like to get down that I might take a break. And I'm hoping this is not gonna derail my progress too much. But what I think I'm gonna do is get back in the afternoon, finish problem set three. Including problem set three and everything we've covered, we've got more than enough things to chew over, chew the cud, so to speak, um, to try to uh, fix some misunderstandings, fix some weaknesses, understand some problems a little better. Uh, and so what I'm hoping I'm gonna do is pick maybe about uh, five to ten and then we'll see how many I get through five to ten kind of key uh, concepts that I want to nail down with some Feynman techniques so I can get a better understanding of them uh, that's going to slow me down a little bit so that means that I still have to do problems four and five when we get to Monday 
Um, I don't think if I run out of time here in the five and techniques, I think I'm going to just push to problem set four on Monday because I don't want to push it too far. If I'm looking at the calendar here, uh, let me just uh, do a quick uh, thing here. Uh, let me just go. So if I just look at the calendar here, so getting to here, obviously we've got five of the problem sets, but we still have five more problem sets and we have quite a few more lectures, including two exams. So given this, I'm thinking that what we're probably going to have to do is uh, try to finish these, try to finish up to here with lectures next week. So if I, I'm going to probably, mm, how many lectures do we have? And there are 14 lectures. I've been doing them about normal speed. That means that, you know, good chance I could probably do four per day, 14. That's a little more than three days. So given the three days here, I think we probably, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to send it to live here. We probably don't want to push uh, this doing these problem sets much past Tuesday. So that's what I'm going to do. Finish this off in the afternoon, get through some Feynman techniques. Monday, I will recommence with promises four and five. Uh, and then hopefully promises four and five, I can be done those by, let's say, let's give myself till Tuesday morning. Regardless of where I'm done on Tuesday morning, I'm going to switch back to the lectures and try to push through so that by the end of the second week, I'll be done all the lectures. And after being done all the lectures, I think it's going to have enough space that, okay, I've done everything now. Now it's just practicing the entire course and we'll have a good two weeks to chew through everything else. Finish the problem sets, go back to the earlier problem sets, work on material, work on practicing, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, overall, this is challenging, but it's also fun. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that... Uh, if I keep working on it, I can get to at least a good intuitive understanding, and we'll just have to see how far I can get uh, by the end of the uh, by the end of the month. All right, see you uh, this.